Abolition is for Everybody is a podcast that tackles the sometimes difficult conversations around prison abolition. I'm Ra. And I'm Taina. And I'm Lee. We're excited to talk about the possibilities and realities of abolition in today's world with you. Join us for a friendly talk, sometimes with guest experts. Just a reminder, friends, in this episode and every episode, we talk about very sensitive and often personal issues. Take care of you. Let's do it. How did you get into this work, Taina? And tell us a little bit about like your beliefs around abolition. So I got involved in abolition work because I'm directly impacted by the mass incarceration system. Um, when I was a child, my dad was always in and out of jail. Um, my mom has been to jail and so have both of my siblings. So I'm the only person in my immediate family, knock on wood, who has not been incarcerated. And then when I was 22, I had a loved one who got arrested and was facing multiple life sentences. And that made this experience like that much more real to me. So in going through um, his court process, I won't say trial process because he ended up taking a plea deal like 95% of impacted people do. Um, and, you know, he ended up being sentenced to 10 years and serving seven years of which I spent pretty much every weekend um, in the prison visiting him, it became clearer and clearer to me that the way that we deal with harm in this country is not effective. Um, Prisons and and jails do not work. Um, And that we have so many other options and we absolutely have the power to implement new new ways of of dealing with harm. Um, But I think something that I also learned And then I'm excited to talk more about in this episode is the fact that we focus much too much on the individual and are not looking at the system and how the system causes harm and how the system um, like perpetuates the ways in in which we harm each other. So, yeah, I think that's that's something that led me into this work and led me to start thinking about prison abolition. A few things came up for me right now, Ra, I don't know about you, but when Taina was talking um, the one thing about the at the amount of people that actually take plea bargains versus mm-hmm. going to trial. Um, the system is just so based upon fear and, and instilling fear in folks. And, you know, people often say that the system is like broken and we both know that it's not right. It's really designed to oppress people and to break people and to instill fear in folks. And it's working like more than fine. It's working really well. Yeah, absolutely. That's where my my journey as an abolitionist began was um, by me like understanding firsthand like how harmful the prison system is. And, you know, really me just having faith like that there has to be something different. There has to be another way that we can deal with with, you know, the situations in which individuals cause harm. Um, but we also need to acknowledge the ways in which the system is, is causing like incredible harm. Like for myself, I have been diagnosed with PTSD because of, um, my ex-husband's incarceration. So I, I come to this work because I firmly believe like that we just have to do better. Like the, the cycles of trauma are ongoing and and nonstop, like the longer and longer we pretend that we can just like reform our way out of the harm that the prison system causes. Yeah, Lee, like that makes me want to know a little bit more about about you and how your journey began. I was just walking by outside and Sebastian (laughs) said, hey, we're doing a podcast. No, um, like you, my family members, um, I'm one of seven kids and all of the boys and the youngest boy, all of all of the boys in my family have been incarcerated and in prison. And so it's a cycle that has been going on in my, my family um, for, you know, generations and growing up, I never felt like I was not only not connected to my family, I wasn't connected to my community. Um, I grew up with a lot of issues surrounding um, sadness, um, not feeling like loved or worthy of love. And these led me to seeking attention from those around me. Um, the people that were around me were 
in the mind state of dysfunction. They either were battling their own drug addictions, they were battling their own um, issues with being in the lower economic status. Um, they were battling issues with relationships. And so I started to model and I started to see like what was happening around me and I started to embrace it and um, basically started swimming through it. And I started off with smoking weed and um, like breaking into like people's yards and stuff and um, stealing things in order to have the the finances to be able to buy marijuana and one thing just led to the next and um i ended up with a charge of murder robbery at the age of 17 and super scared didn't know what i had like didn't understand the full ramifications of of what i had done um, but I knew that what I had done was was wrong. My father was killed when I was a when I was a child, and um, I knew how that felt. And so, I I started. I just had like a complete meltdown, a breakdown at that point in my life at the age of seventeen, and vowed that I would never intentionally harm another human being in my life. And and so we're getting a call in from CDCR right now, um, and and so I wanted to be pre my crime i wanted to be like the tough guy and i wanted to be noticed in the tough guy world and then after my crime i went to the opposite which was counterintuitive to what the system actually promotes it promotes separatism it promotes racism it promotes oppression it promotes fear and it promotes um violence like within the incarceration um system and so i went in there and i was trying to tell people that wanted to be tough and wanted to be um wanted to be noticed of, or at least to stave off the fear that they probably had for themselves using intimidation and violence that i wasn't a part of that and so um going through the going through the system i started to like try to figure out who i was as a person, right? Not my morals, my principles. I wanted to learn more about like who I who I was and who I wanted to be. And so that's how my change started. And then I started to look at, after I married my inner education with higher education, I started to look at the system as a whole and see how like, how it was designed, what it was doing and how it was affecting our community, how it was affecting me and how it was affecting my peers. Um, and so that's kind of like what brought me to the abolitionist work. And there's always this conversation when you, you tell somebody that you're a prison abolitionist, they're like, oh, what, you just think you're going to get rid of all prisons? Like you, <laughs> what people shouldn't be punished for their crimes. And I says, well, let's just start to break down some of those terms a little bit, right? Let's just start to, let's start to unpack and unravel like what you're saying, punishment versus um, healing and punishment versus transformative and giving folks the opportunity to be able to unpack what's on their heart when they don't believe in prison abolition. Um, but once we start to really have like a discourse or a conversation about it, they realize that they're more of a prison abolitionist than what they gave themselves credit from for at the, at the onset. And so I really love having those conversations and being able to talk to people um, about healing our communities versus continuous, continuously harming them. Um, so that's just like a tidbit. I'm sure as we continue to go on, I'll talk a little bit more about, you know, my incarceration. Um, I was locked up for 25 years. So I have a lot of experience um, about the CDCR and, and what happens in there and what goes on and, and like the psychological effects. I, I uh, not only went through it myself, I also like guided other folks through it and, and trying to like create a space for them to be as healthy as they, they possibly could be um, living in that type of environment. What about you, Ra? I feel like I've talked like, I think for 67 minutes. Um, <laughs> no, I think that was a, a very consecutive and, and, you know, it's a, it's a story, you know, uh, our lives, our stories, and ultimately abolition is an ideology, which is to say every, every bit of our life story, I think folds into 
this eventual belief in the possibility of a better world. You know, every single piece of our story matters to how we became an abolitionist. Um, for myself, it was almost like a the opposite situation uh, from both of y'all. Um, no one I knew had ever been to jail or prison. I'm not sure people in my family knew where our jail was or um, the difference between jail and prison, any of those things. My teachers, my parents are teachers and um, my siblings are all in uh, equivalent type fields, you know, um, CPAs and jobs that you really just don't ask any questions about because they sound pretty straightforward as to what they do. And, um, you know, I served a, a year and a half in prison, so a real short time. And uh, That's ironic that you say real short time. Like a year and a half is a long time <laughs> to be separated from your family, your loved ones, your community. A lot of things happened during that year and a half. A lot of things happen, yeah. I mean, a lot of things happen in a, in a short period of time, but in the respect to how much time people serve within that system you know it's it's just a blink of an eye really but yeah a lot of things happen in my time notably in my case my husband passed away um, a year to the date that I was inside um, so when Taina talks about PTSD from um, being on the outside like that's that's so real you know um, in in the prison world there's a lot of talk about what it means to be system impacted you know, if, if someone who didn't actually serve time is system impacted. And the thing is, these things are like ripples within ripples within ripples. You know, um, my husband literally died being the person not on the inside. So I know how much it can it can weigh, weigh on a person, especially a person who I think had a similar disposition to what you were talking about in your youth. Um, and so, yeah, it was a, it was a rough year and a half. But um, honestly, that didn't even make me a prison abolitionist. I um, had done a lot of charitable work before my prison life. Um, and then I went inside and saw it doesn't take you more than a day to see how badly things are inside and uh, worse, how purposeful that badly run system is, you know, how deliberate it is. And uh, still, I came home thinking that, you know, maybe a reform here or a reform there. and um, and then one of my friends, I'm a poet as well, and they said there was going to be a book reading and uh, Miriam Kaba was going to be there, who I didn't know, but my friend was excited about. And I was like, sure. And she, she said, you know, sometimes she writes about prison stuff. And so I was like, okay. Um, and of course, anyone who knows Miriam Kaba knows that that's a very reductive <laughs> um, um, synopsis of her body of work, which is this extensive foray into the world of prison, abolition, and um, all, and abolition of all, all kinds, um, the fullest version of that word. Anyways, as she was talking about what abolition was, I was like, oh yeah, I believe that. And of course I believe that. And oh yeah, I believe that. And when I left, I was like, oh, I guess I am a prison abolitionist. Right. <laughs> I do believe all these things and the resources are there. I know the system doesn't work. I know people are I know community care works. So yeah, that's what brought me to abolition. You know, Ron, and listening to you talk is bringing up a lot of things for me. And it's also making me realize that I think my journey to abolition might have started a lot earlier than I had originally thought it did. Um, so I initially, like when I first heard the term abolition, you know, framed as, as prison abolition, I think that I was, you know, alongside a lot of the, the skeptics now who were like, so what are we going to do? Just get rid of, of police and, and prisons. And um, I know it's a podcast, so folks can't see me, but I'm, I'm a woman of color. I'm a Afro Puerto Rican woman. And I grew up in like a very low income community. Both of my parents were addicted to drugs and alcohol. We were very poor. We spent a good amount of my childhood and adolescence, um, you know, homeless living in in motels and I, I witnessed an incredible amount of violence. My home was not a safe place when I was a child. Um, and, and to this day, you know, like a, a lot of those issues are, are still true. My mom overdosed five years ago and is in a coma now. Um, so, you know, these, these things are still like very much a reality for me. Um, but I, I think the first time in, you know, my like conscious memory of like recognizing that the system of like prison and jails and police didn't, doesn't work was probably when I was 12. Um, we were living in a motel and I don't know where my dad was. My dad would just disappear sometimes. And my mom and I were 
getting into like a heated argument. She was drunk. She was high and I did not feel safe. So I called the police on my mom at the age of 12. And I said, you know, like help us, you know, I don't know where my dad is. My mom is in a state where she, you know, where she's threatening violence against us, help us. And the police came to the motel and they didn't do anything. They were just like, oh, well, you know, we don't even have any evidence that, you know, anything illegal is happening. And I definitely didn't want my mom to go to jail, um, but I just didn't know what else to do at the age of 12. I just wanted us to feel safe. Um, and, you know, I was never made aware of any like social services. I, I would think that the police would be like, hey, a 12 year old kid just called the cops on their mom. Maybe we should intervene. But that didn't happen. Um, there was never any intervention that wasn't associated with the police or incarceration for my family. I was never offered like therapy or, you know, anything, anything that could have potentially helped us like heal from, from the very traumatic things that we were going through. So I spent a lot of my life just kind of watching, you know, my, my parents cause like real harm against me um, and my siblings and, you know, I grew up just thinking like, yeah, like they should, you know, be held accountable for what they're doing, but I didn't want them to go to jail. I watched my dad go in and out of jail and nothing ever got better when he came home. Um, the only, my dad actually did end up getting sober, but it was after he spent a good amount of time in a rehab center. Um, and he told me that the only reason that he was able to get sober was because I supported him at the age of 14. Like I would write him letters and tell him like, you know, dad, I love you and I want you to get sober. So it wasn't so much even, you know, it wasn't incarceration. It wasn't even like the institution of the rehab facility. It was, it was support. It was like hope. It was something to look forward to that, that helped him get sober. So then as I, I got older, like that was a lesson that I really took with me is that like, we really only are able to hear heal when we have the support that we need. And prisons are the absolute opposite of support. Like Lee, you spoke to, you know, isolation and when folks are removed from their families, they're removed from their communities, they're removed from everything that they need to feel like, you know, maybe there's a sliver of hope and they can do something different. So I think that is something that slowly, you know, started to make me realize like, oh, yes, we do have terrible things that are happening in our communities, but prison is not the solution. Prison, not only is it not the solution, it makes it worse. It exacerbates harm. And what we actually need are like services in the community and also just, you know, ways of, of being able to show up for one another. I think that's something that, that I'm really excited to talk about more, um, you know, especially for folks who may be listening, who are thinking like, okay, you know, I'm kind of on the fence with this abolition thing. I'm, I'm really looking forward to listening to the two of you dive into um, what it means to be an abolitionist and what alternative um, services we can have that can truly make our community safer. So yeah, Lee, you know, I'm wondering, you know, what you think about, about this topic and you know, if you wanted to share a little bit more about like, I don't know, what did, what did you first think of when you heard the word abolition? You know, I, I feel like that it was built up as a, like a rebellious belief, right? Like somebody that was an abolitionist was somebody that was rebelling against social norms. Um, and I feel since I've been able to kind of like really internalize it, that if you are somebody that is kind, caring, and empathetic, you're an abolitionist. Because those are the key tenets to what it means to be an abolitionist, is you want the best for folks, and you want them to become their best self. You know, at the back end of my email, I have, be the change you wish to see in the world. Um, and I, I completely, like, strive every day to live to that, to that, um, to that decree is because for so long, I feel like the 
the person with the biggest microphone or the person with the loudest voice or the strongest hand are the ones that have kind of dictated what happens in our communities and in our society. And the very system that has encased itself in this armor of protection, not only with taxes, but with fear and, and with like the growth of this beast and if we want to use the term who's sitting in the belly of that beast, right? It's the people that are actually being encaged. And so I, I feel if you're somebody that is against abolition, you're actually imprisoning yourself because you're not opening yourself up to another way of thinking, another way of looking at societal harms. I know when the abolitionist movement for the ending of prisons first came about, it was somewhere in the eighties when they had like the war on drugs and the war on, on crime, right? There was like this super thing where they were using terms like super predators and, and that, that type of descriptions to instill fear within our community that, you know, crimes were on the rise and um, people needed to be locked away and, and kept away from, from their family members and their loved ones in their community. But they didn't say it that way, right? They said that Johnny did bad. Johnny is bad right? And Johnny needs to be away from everyone else that has not done bad. Um, and so coming into like the term of being an abolitionist or somebody that believes in, in prison abolition, um, like you said, Taina, I'm really looking forward to just unpacking these in a personal experience and other people's testimonies and their narratives, but also bringing in the, the history of where prisons come from, where transformative justice comes from, where the prospect of being able to heal the folks that, um, that are suffering from any type of mental illness or any type of false ideologies or things that don't ring true for them to be able to kind of like, let's put all of this on the table, I think is, is the most important thing. It isn't me against you. It isn't you against me or, or society. It's about trying to come up with solutions, practical real world solutions that have a proven history of working and ones that do not work and how we can change the ones that don't work into something that does work. And so that's kind of like um, when I first like came into abolition or I started to hear about the term or the word that it was villainized. And so I too automatically put my defenses up. I put my guards up um, to it because I didn't want to be like the, the rebel um, of rebelling against society. What about you, Ra? I think similarly, um, you know, the word abolition comes into conversation as, as to your point, a, a rebellious thought. Um, but when you start breaking down abolition into its tiniest and most active forms, you realize that we, we practice it inherently all the time. Uh, children practice it. People in safe positions practice it. Um, the communities I grew up in that were safe, that never had police come through. Uh, when something happened in our neighborhood, when somebody... To, to your example, Johnny, when Johnny did bad, we fixed it. You know, we went to Johnny's house and we thought about Johnny's life and we decided as a local community what we could do better. And if anyone brought up calling the police, we would all be like, hey, <laughs> no need to escalate this. Um, it was it was never really an option because um, it didn't need to be. We knew we could call. Um, we weren't the type of neighborhood that police officers terrorize traditionally. So we were safe in that. But um, despite that, we still knew what tools do they possibly have, you know? So in that situation, let's say um, Johnny stole something from a neighbor. Um, that neighbor would go talk to Johnny's family, you know, and they would figure that out because um, the police only have one tool. And if you don't want that tool to be used, what good is it? You know, so it's like calling a plumber. Johnny stole from his neighbor and we're going to call a plumber. Well, the plumber only has a certain set of tools. So unless this is going to help that, unless Johnny stole a toilet, you know, this is not going right. to help us. <laughs> that's sort of the way our communities worked. Um, and that's, that's how communities work when they get to be safe, when they have the resources they need, when the teacher and the doctor and the lawyer live in that neighborhood, you know, and um, 
children too practice abolition. You know, they they practice the smallest form of not involving large institutions at every turn. You know, they they learn the name of their neighbors. They ask the kid next to them for a pencil. They bring extra pencils because they know somebody in class doesn't have them. And it's sort of like a, it's a very inherent humanity that we have that we are told doesn't scale. And that's ultimately the practical problem that's put to us. We say, well, that's sure, you can learn the names of all your neighbors, but how do you scale that across the country? And um, one of the things that made abolition make sense to me on a larger scale was, again, that presentation by Mariam Kaba, where she just explained, we already do that. The only difference is, is that those organizations that are set up to help us scale it are shut down at every turn. You know, they're made to go through hoops and they are regularly policed. And so all of these things step in the way of our own efforts to care for ourselves, our own efforts to bring extra pencils to class and check in on Johnny. And so what we mostly need to do to start is, um, you know, for me, because I know there's a lot of different takes on abolition, a lot of people focus on their their corner and go hard. And, and mine tends to be ending mass incarceration. And, um, and because I think that's taking away a major tool of the police. So that inherently defunds their power, you know, more importantly than their money, it defunds the, the most important and only real tool of terror they have. And so I put my energy in that. But along the journey, of course, I've met so many other abolitionists who are um, houselessness advocates and black liberation advocates and education advocates, and they feel that their way also, also does it. And I, I really think it does because when you work towards liberation, no matter which pathway you're going, we all eventually end up at the same place where, um, we take care of each other. We do right by ourselves. And that's abolition. Yeah, thank you so much, Ra. And I was just reflecting on, you know, how you had shared that your childhood experience was, you know, different from mine and Lee's in the sense that you, you know, had access to resources and also um, your neighborhood was not one that was over policed. And it just made me think about something that that I see people um, write about quite often is the the sense that communities are not safer when they have more police, they're safer when they have more resources. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I think really is like at the core of the conversation around abolition. Like we are universally agreeing as abolitionists that what we do not need is more punishment and trauma and to continue cycles of violence and harm. What we do need is just to, to care for one another, both on the individual and like community level, but that the state also should be providing um, like a, if we want to talk about systems, we should be providing like a, a system of care. Um, but I, something else that I would really like um, you all to touch on, you know, I know a lot of folks are probably listening to this and are saying like, yeah, but it's still really tough for me to, to get on the abolition train because of, you know, X, Y, or Z reason. Um, so I think, you know, maybe we could talk about like what were like some of the, the struggles for us um, to begin to identify as abolitionists and, you know, maybe what helped get us over the hurdle. I'll say for me, um, I didn't always associate abolitionists with people who were interested in policy change. Um, I, I thought that, you know, either you had reform or you had abolition and there wasn't really like any space in between. And, you know, I'm a person who is very passionate about policy change. I've worked for the legislature in the past. I've worked for several nonprofits as a policy advocate. Um, and, you know, I, I believe like firmly like that we actually needed to change rules and laws in order to bring people home from prison and make our community safer. So I saw abolition as something different than that. Um, but that was not right. And, you know, that that slowly came on to me is that, that there's a difference between, um, you know, reform and like tinkering with the system and, you know, policy changes that are abolitionist. Um, you know, I believe that an abolitionist policy is something that is taking power or resources away from these systems and pu of punishment and putting them back into the communities. Abolitionists understand, um, you know, I think to a point that you had made earlier, Ra, that the system is not broken. It's operating exactly the way that it should. 
um, <laughs> that it was intended to. And we need to change the system. We need to abolish the system, get rid of it, throw the whole thing away and create something new, create something that is rooted in community care, create something that take us to, takes the focus off of the individual and puts it back on to the community as a whole. So I think once I started to realize that abolition does include policy change, um, which I think is you know relevant to us having this conversation as you know, staff members of Initiate Justice, which is, of course, a policy organization. Yes, we can be abolitionists and that we could push for abolitionist policy changes that, that actually help us get where we want to be. But yeah, I'm, I'm curious, um, Lee, if, if you can think of, you know, what were some of the things that caused you to struggle with the concept of identifying as an abolitionist? Yeah, I think I, I continuously live in a state of um, struggle. That's because I'm, I'm, always learning new things and I'm and I'm the type of person that is always curious right I want to learn um, and do more and so uh, one of the things is is like when you start to talk about abolition it's like the extreme that people like automatically go to like and they put a wall up right and they build that wall and they're like nope not going to do it. I'm not going to go down that route. I'm not even going to talk about it. Like if people do wrong, there needs to be some type of, some type of intervention. And then, you know, I get to start to have that talk about, okay, what does intervention look like? Who should go to prison? Like you're talking about, what about the rapists and the murderers, right? Like that you go to that automatic extreme and you're like, well, do you know how many people that are actually incarcerated are in there for those crimes. So if we take those people aside um, and just talk about the other ones that have suffered from drug addiction or that have suffered from poverty um, and we start to talk about them, do they also need to be, you know, with the rapists and murder murderers? Do you need to put them in that category, in that box? And so really starting to um, delve into it and and kind of separate the the terms, I'm of this accord if I can start to get you, like, you don't need to necessarily right now be on the abolition train, but let's get on the same track, right? Let's let's start heading in the same direction. And I believe the, the cause and the way of life will lead you down that track to where you're boarding that train of abolition. And so if we can start to dismantle or divert and let's be diversionist then i think i just made that word up um mm -hmm. let's divert some of the funds let's divert some of the resources that are in the in prison industrial complex and start investing them into our communities and into our children and into our our, our home lives in order to make life happy or more fun or more palatable or whatever the case may be that led folks to depression, to, um, to crime or to drug use or whatever it is. If we start to lessen those reasons, those foundational causative factors that led to that, um, it's all going to lead to the abolition of prisons, all of it. And so this is where I like, I think a lot of people struggle where they say you're either with this or against this. I'm of the accord of like, you could just be with me on some things and I can support you on that. And you can support me on that because ultimately it's going to lead to prison abolition. And that's, that's kind of how I feel, but there are some, you know, some deal breakers and some barriers where I just can't get down with. Um, but I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss that more and more as we kind of bring on our guest and bring the other, the other folks into the fold. Um, I feel like we're in like this circle where it goes, <laughs> Taina, Lee, Ra. Um, the game of Uno. The, the game of Uno, right? <laughs> um, but that's definitely like some of the struggles that I've had with folks is, you know, there's that term where, and we use this a lot at uh, Initiate Justice. The people that are closest to the problem or closest to the issues are also closest to the solutions, right? And so once we really start to bring people to the table that are closest to the problems and closest to the issues, we're going to find the solutions as we go along. And that's not to say that we have the solution to everything because it's all kind of um, trial and error 
from the onset of our lives, whether it's us learning to walk or us learning to drive or us learning, you know, where, what field we want to be. It's all trial and error with, with how we kind of get to the places where we want to go. Um, in addition to that, I also feel like as we embark upon this train ride um, and folks start to get on, get on the train with us, that we will all end up in a, in a better place than where we first boarded the train. Um, and if that is just in the simple measure of treating people with kindness, caring for people and having a empathetic um, approach to how they first boarded the train or the tracks that they traveled in order to get to the train. Well, I hope after listening to, you know, the three of us discuss like what our journey has been, like folks can um, understand that like any part of the journey that you're on is like, okay. And asking questions is okay. And, you know, feeling that the need to have more information is okay. That's, that's completely normal. And that's how we all should be making our decisions, um, you know, based on the facts. Um, but I would encourage folks to, you know, come into these conversations, which can be difficult with an open mind, with an open heart. Um, and, you know, maybe have coming in with um, a bit of self-awareness and recognizing that, you know, we've been socialized to believe that police and prisons are the only form of accountability or that punishment overall as a concept is the best form of accountability. So I would really invite folks to come into the space with, you know, their, their listening ears, their open hearts, and um, really be open to new ideas. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense that people want to feel safe. I know, you know, for myself, I want to feel safe. Um, when I was a child, I wanted to feel safe from the real, like, violent and scary conditions that were occurring in my household. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's time for us as a society, it's overdue for us to recognize that our current punishment criminal legal system is an epic failure and we can tap into our radical imaginations and envision something better, but not just envision it, that we can be supporting policies and we can be supporting the shifting of resources away from punishment and into community care. listening to Abolition is for Everybody, sponsored by Initiate Justice. Be sure to follow us at Abolition is underscore on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for regular updates. To support, please rate and comment wherever you listen to your podcasts. Those five-star ratings help other people find their way to us, so thank you. You can also join us at Abolition Corner on the fourth Tuesday of every month to further your exploration of abolition in a small group. To learn more, please visit initiatejustice.org slash abolition dash corner.